Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Donald Trump, he is gone from the White House, but he is swimming in red ink and legal troubles that have followed him all the way to Mar-a-Lago. Tonight, a constitutional law expert, he'll tell us which lawsuits and which criminal cases could cause the most trouble for Donald J. Trump. We'll also take a closer look at Trump's financial problems, his golf courses, hotels, resorts. They're all hemorrhaging money here. Trump name all but toxic. Banks, they don't want to lend him any money. All of that spells out big problems for the guy who sold himself as a financial genius to the American public. We're going to show you how he's anything but. Then, the Republican Party, they are at a crossroads with Trump and Mitch McConnell fighting to be the face of the GOP. A former top Trump administration official, he'll join us to talk about the discussions of forming a third party that he's been a big part of, plus highlights from President Biden's town hall last night, as well as more on the deadly storms that are slamming Texas and other parts of our viewing area and country, and how even bad weather has become politicized by the right. Now we're gonna talk about the political and the financial issues surrounding Trump in a second, but first, let's start with a legal. And we begin with a Capitol Hill riot and the words of Mitch McConnell. But impeachment was never meant to be the final forum for American justice. President Trump is still liable for everything he did while he was in office as an ordinary citizen. Unless the statute of limitations is run, still liable for everything he did while he's in office. Didn't get away with anything yet. And trust me, folks have heard the words. The Attorney General of the District of Columbia and the U.S. Attorney in D.C., they could reportedly open incitement of violence charges against Donald Trump. We also now have the first major lawsuit over Trump's role in the attack. The suit, excuse me, filed by the NAACP on behalf of Congressman Benny Thompson in Mississippi says Trump and Rudy Giuliani violated a federal statute when they incited a violent riot with the goal of preventing Congress from certifying the election. The Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, they were also named in the suit as those far-right groups, part of the mob, as you know, that stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Now, many people from those groups and others like QAnon, they have been arrested, and there's a common theme emerging in their defenses. Many of their attorneys, they're saying that they were duped by Trump, and Trump sent them to the Capitol that very day. Also, we have this. The widow of a police officer who took his own life tragically after the Capitol was attacked, she spoke with the Washington Post and said the following, and I quote, If he, her late husband, didn't go to work that day, he would still be alive. And the brother-in-law of one of the women who died during the riots is blaming Trump directly, saying that Trump incited the riot and caused his death. Capitol siege, a result, as we know, of Trump's lies about the election and his bullying of election officials in Georgia, a focus of another criminal probe by the Fulton County DA. Now, the investigation is focused on a call that Trump made that was caught on tape here, a portion of. We have won this election in Georgia based on all of this. And there's, there's nothing wrong with, with saying that, Brad. Well, Mr. President, the challenge that you have is the data you have is wrong. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. So tell me, Brad, what are we going to do? Uh, we won the election, and it's not fair to take it away from us like this. The DA in Georgia says the prosecutors are looking at more than just that single phone call. The investigation seems that it will go past just this one phone call. What I know about investigations is they're kind of like peeling back an onion. And as you go through each layer, you learn different things. From Georgia, we go to New York, where Trump facing legal issues with the city and also the state. The Manhattan DA's office has opened a criminal probe into possible fraud, both uh, bank, tax, and insurance surrounding a Trump family property in Westchester County, just north of the city. Subpoenas, they've already been issued for the Seven Springs case. And believe me, it's not limited to just that. Then you go to the state level, where the Attorney General Letitia James conducting a civil investigation into whether or not the Trump Organization inflated the values of assets in order to get favorable loan and insurance terms. And on the civil front, both of the women on your screen E. Jean Carroll and Summer Zervos, they have accused Trump of sexual assault. They're now suing for defamation because Trump said they lied. Trump is, of course, denying all the allegations. So, trust me, 
That's a fraction of the legal challenges facing the now former president. And to help us unpack those, let's bring in my next guest, Rick Pildes. He's a professor of constitutional law at NYU. And I'm sure I left out a dozen more, Richard. But um, the point is, uh, as a private citizen, the president, it, it is in a completely different world. And let's start off in Washington. I mentioned the suit filed this week by the NAACP um, and even the criminal probe, theoretically, that the DOJ could take up. Talk about the exposure the president has because of the riots, his actions leading to it, and his reaction um, while the riots were ongoing. So let's start first with uh, the action that a lot of people are, are talking about, or potential action, which is um, what is his exposure for criminal incitement, uh, for being convicted criminally uh, for statements made at the rally or even statements made before the rally? Uh, I think that's going to be a, a tough uh, road to hoe for prosecutors if they decide to, to go that route. Because as you probably know, in the American system, uh, we have such a robust First Amendment um, that it gives tremendous latitude to speakers um, and makes it impossible to hold them for uh, liable for violence that may have a connection to what they have said. But unless they are imminently inciting violence, um, and the sort of classic form of that is, you know, go shoot that person now, go attack that building now. I think on the criminal side, it may be that the former president faces greater liability in Georgia in those suits you discussed in Georgia uh, because the phone calls are recorded. Um, it's uh, pretty clear in that phone call the kind of pressure that he's putting on the secretary of state. Uh, to try to change the vote count. But um, I think the prosecutor is right that when you start um, looking deeply into these matters with all of the investigative power of a district attorney, um, you don't entirely know what you're going to find until you find it. Hypothetically, uh, let's say at some point during discovery, um, the rumors are confirmed that um, let's say that um, the intelligence authorities had warned the president uh, prior to January 6th, uh, that there was um, a lot of dangerous actors that were convening on the Capitol um, with intentions uh, of raiding um, uh, or rioting uh, all the way up to Capitol Hill with the date and the time that the president chose, and he ignored those warnings. Furthermore, let's say the phone conversations, there were eyewitnesses to the McCarthy conversation where when a plea for help was made, um, the cavalry was not sent, and it was not sent consciously by the president. From a civil standpoint, with the different threshold to that, I mentioned the widow saying, if my, if my husband wasn't caught in the riots, uh, he would still be with us. Um, what about the standard there, and especially what could be learned during the discovery process? Yeah, well, certainly there's a lot uh, of factual material we'd, we would like to know. We would certainly like a lot more information about what the president knew, when he knew it, uh, what he did or failed to do. Uh, there will be congressional investigations that will take a lot of time, I think, but we'll probably um, explore those kinds of issues. Um, the, the suit by the, uh, the widow of the police officer who very, very tragically uh, took his life, um, you know, that's, that's a very tough one in terms of holding um, a third party responsible for that. Um, typically in American law, um, you know, there's enough of a sense of uh, even those kinds of choices uh, still being intervening choices of the individual involved. Um, and so I, I think legally that that would be a tough case. Um, I do think the case that uh, the representative in Congress has brought is an interesting one. Uh, arguing that the president conspired with Rudy Giuliani, maybe with others, uh, to disrupt Congress from carrying out its functions. That's a civil case, so the standard is not a criminal standard. Um, and if there's discovery that goes forward on that, that will be another place where we may get a lot, a lot more information about exactly what, went ha what happened between the president and <laughs> Rudy Giuliani, for example, um, in terms of whether they intentionally uh, conspired to try to set things up to to actually stop Congress from counting the vote on January 6th. 
so I think that's, uh, we haven't had a suit like that in a long, long time, but I think that's an interesting one to, uh, to keep an eye on. Then I would say uh, the civil suits from his business enterprise, uh, even before he became president, just the suits in New York that are basically based on what his lawyer, Michael Cohn, testified under oath to Congress when Michael Cohn said uh, the president in his business regularly overinflated assets when he wanted them to be a high value, like for bank loans, understated their value when he was dealing with potential tax liability. Um, you know, I, I think that's an area where there already has been quite a lot of action that's been taking place uh, legally. Um, and I suspect that uh, is an area where the president may have uh, some of the greatest uh, financial exposure for the business side of, of things he did before he was in office, not for actions he took uh, as president. Uh, friends I had that were in the Southern District, um, and if we remember when uh, there was, uh, you know, dismissals, whether well, first we were told his resignation, then he was forced out, there was a feeling that in the Mueller probe, there were elements of the case which Mueller didn't believe were germane to the, to the scope of the probe that he farmed out here, whether to the Eastern District, Southern District, or other area courts, that um, the real worry for Trump was those came alive once he became a private citizen, especially if they didn't expire and he lost after the first term of the statute of limitations. What about that? Um, could there be problems coming from the Southern District? Forget about the Manhattan DA's office or even Tish James's office as the state AG. Yes, so there's certainly been talk about whether uh, uh, the, the U.S. government, the U.S. attorneys would pursue obstruction of justice charges against the president for the actions described in the Mueller report. If you remember, uh, the Mueller report was careful to say it was not taking a position on whether the actions it described uh, constituted obstruction of justice or not. Uh, and as you said, the president in the United States can't be criminally prosecuted while in office. Uh, but I'm sure they are looking into the question of whether the actions detailed in the Mueller report uh, constitute the, the crime of obstruction of justice. Again, there are complicated legal issues there when it's the president involved. Um, there's a lot of dispute about whether those obstruction statutes apply to the president and how they apply to the president. Um, but I, I would certainly imagine that uh, those issues are being looked into. One thing I would point out also is that uh, the Southern District or any U.S. Attorney's Office is not going to bring a case like that against a former president without the Attorney General signing off on the prosecution. And so uh, we will have a new Attorney General when Merrick Garland gets confirmed, as everyone expects um, he will. Um, and so I think that kind of decision would ultimately get made uh, at the level of the Attorney General, which will presumably be, be Merrick Garland. Um, the Southern District will make a recommendation um, but I, I think that that's an attorney general's call ultimately. And so he'll have a lot on his plate as well. Sure. And there's an open-ended question as to the appetite of the Biden administration to go after um, uh, the now former president and Trump, uh, at least on their end. But then this all begs the broader question, which is, okay, Trump is known as possibly the worst client to have because he doesn't listen to counsel uh, from the attorneys, let alone he might stiff the attorneys when it comes to uh, their fee, et cetera. Um, what we even saw play out and the legal team he did with an impeachment on the line, what does that tell you about when you're getting into fiscal forensics, et cetera, that he's going to have to deal with in New York? He may not surround himself by the greatest legal brain trust here, and that will show up in those kind of cases? Well, I think that's a good question. And, you know, the impeachment process is as much a political process as a legal process. I mean, even more, ultimately, it's a political judgment uh, that, that elected officials are making. Um, and so the quality of the lawyering may or may not matter as much there. But when you get into a courtroom situation, criminal or civil, and as you point out, you know, particularly these incredibly complicated uh, potential suits involving his business, uh, you certainly want the best representation. Uh, it can make a difference to the outcome. And it's not clear right now uh, uh, what kind of representation the president, a uh, former president, is going to be able to get. Uh, we don't know, you know, what we saw with the impeachment process, uh, which centered primarily on what he did on January 6th. 
uh, you know, what that tells us about whether first rate um, lawyers are no longer going to be willing to uh, represent him uh, or whether they'll feel differently about civil actions involving his business uh, as opposed to actions while he was uh, in the Oval Office. But, um, but yes, I think it will be very interesting to see what kind of legal representation former President Trump does get. And there will be a whole lot of litigation, I have a feeling, coming. Richard Pildes, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Rich. And coming up next, as the last of Trump's bankrupt casinos in Atlantic City is imploded, I'm going to show you how that's more than just a fitting symbol for Trump's finances.